a lesson that we don't realize how much we depend on the light until we don't have it. So let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the light. And Father, so often we don't realize how much we are dependent on you until we're in a place of darkness. And so, Lord, as we gather together this morning, as we start this Easter month, um, Lord, just keep our eyes focused on you. And even in the darkness, Lord, um, may we see your light. May we know you well enough that even when the lights around us go out, Lord, that um, we have your word that will provide what we need. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. So, one year, a law school professor began his class by writing two numbers down, a four and a two. And then beside it, he asked the question, what's the solution? Well, someone blurted out six, somebody else said, oh, it's two, and then several shouted, no, it's eight. And with each answer, the professor just shook his head. And then he pointed out the problem with all their answers. He said, the reason why you can't tell me the solution is because you all have failed to ask the key question. What is the problem? Unless you know what the problem is, you can't possibly figure out the solution. So what is the solution when a 21-year-old girl who inadvertently gets into the wrong car instead of the Uber that she had ordered ends up getting murdered? What's the solution to the drug epidemic or abortions or pornography or child abuse or the race relations that we're facing? We have a lot of people blurting out their answers and their solutions, but a lot of them don't even realize or they overlook what the real problem is. And the real problem isn't going to be solved by another law or by repaying reparations because the problem of the heart is the problem at heart. And we know it is sin, and that's what Miss Lori was talking about, and we know that it's been around since the beginning, since Adam and Eve. And it's amazing to think that even before we existed, God knew the problem. He knew the problem where where Satan, our sin, where all that would lead us. And even more so, not only did he know the problem, he had the solution in mind. He had the plan for our salvation. Now, we've been studying in Genesis, and so when Mark was reading that, some of you might be going, I thought we were taking a break from Genesis this month. So we're not going to repeat that whole story about the serpent and sin and Adam and Eve. But there is something that I wanted to remind you um, in that reading. I want you to see that it was God who was walking in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had sinned, and after they were hiding in their shame, it was God that went walking and was looking for them. God is the one that was seeking them, and God is still the one that goes and seeks the lost. Mankind, we have become like God, as God said we would when he warned us, when you do this, you will become this, if you remember the Satan, the serpent said, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. And because of sin, man, so to speak, became like God, knowing good and evil. But here's the twist in it. God himself is the one that became like man in the person of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, he came to reveal God, to redeem mankind, to defeat Satan, and to save sinners. In the Gospel of John, John begins by speaking the word. 
And something that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about John, remember John was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. John knew Jesus personally. He was chosen. He was called. He was commissioned by Jesus. This man lived with Jesus. He laughed with him. He cried with him. He walked with him daily for three years. And he was really the only disciple that stood at the foot of the cross when Jesus was being crucified. And he was one of the first two witnesses of his disciples that saw the empty tomb and the resurrected Christ. And John is the one that tells us that this word existed in the beginning of time and beginning of time as we understand it. Because remember, our finite minds don't, can't, we really can't grasp eternity. We can't grasp things that have happened way back that before, before eternity, and then we can't grasp we're going to live for eternity. So in the beginning, as we understand it, the word existed. And what we see is that at Bethlehem, God stopped speaking in an invisible voice, and the word became a person whom people could see and touch. Now, Colossians 1.15 says, we look at the sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at the sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. So when John says, in the beginning was the one called the word, the word was with God and was truly God. What God is saying, is, what John is saying is, the word who is Jesus Christ perfectly reflects all that God is because he is God. Now I want to take this concept of the word a little bit deeper in this. Because well, how we can relate to it is we know the Bible says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? We know when somebody has bitterness or anger or love and joy and all that in them, oftentimes by the words that they speak. Our words, good or bad, show the reality of who we are. And I want you to think about this, that it's the same way with God. His word reveals his heart. So what do his words spoken through the word, who is Jesus Christ, reveal about God's heart? What does Jesus Christ reveal and reflect about God's heart? Well, let's look at the words that he speaks. He speaks light, life, forgiveness, Truth, compassion, hope, love, mercy, patience, goodness, kindness, peace, and righteousness. God has expressed himself. He has made himself known and his heart known by his word. And his word is the person of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.19 continues with, God was pleased to have his whole nature living in Christ. God wants us to know his heart. Why? Because when we know his heart, we're going to love him. We're going to trust him when things don't make sense. And we're going to do this with all our whole heart, our mind, our body, and our soul. This is who Jesus is reflects. It's the heart of God. He reflects God the Father. Now, this last week, and I mean, I know some of you know that I send out texts during the week and everything, and, and, and it all works out good. Well, this last week, though, I sent out one, and it was a, to a gentleman, literally, that he came to church here one time. He lives out of state. He came here with somebody. He asked afterwards if we could talk. We talked and everything since then, which is probably a year ago at least. I send him that text when I get it. Well, he responds back to his text because what I was saying basically is, you know, in all the things that happen in life, God one day is going to make everything that's wrong right. And this is the reply that I got to one of the texts this last week. He said, I've been miserable for the last 35 years. God has failed.
And actually, I'm going to ask you to pray because I'm going to talk to him tomorrow. <laughs> We're going to talk on the phone tomorrow. But what I could reply to him in text is, this is exactly why Jesus came. This darkness that you're in is exactly why Jesus came. Jesus entered the darkness so that we can walk in the light. The darkness and pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, that not only he knows, but many of us have experienced, is why Jesus came to begin with. He was born to bring light and life because he is life and light. So when we read that the light keeps shining in the dark and the darkness has never put it out, we can have hope for something better. And what we need to notice in this, in reading it, the light keeps shining in the darkness. What does this tell us? It tells us that John acknowledges there's darkness. It tells us Jesus acknowledges there's darkness. As Christians, we have to acknowledge it's darkness. We know that it's not all wonderful every day. We walk in darkness. That's why it says the light keeps shining. It keeps going. It keeps persevering. You keep looking for it. You keep going after it. Because we do live in darkness. But here's the thing at the end. The darkness has never put it out. The darkness doesn't have the power to overcome the light. I would almost bet when a lot of the electricity went out, or even if it's dark at nighttime, I would bet most children's rooms have a nightlight. I would bet somewhere in the house you have a light or you have a flashlight or something. We always, we are drawn to the light. We don't like living in darkness. There's a reason scary movies are made in the dark, right? And so this is one of those things. In the dark, one of the things that why we, why some people either are scared of the dark or scared to be in the dark is because we can't see. We can't see what's around the corner. We can't see all these things. But I also want you to see that some people are scared of light because the light brings to light things that we can't see in the dark. I'm going to tell you, at my house, when it's dark, my house looks good. When the lights go on, I see the dust that needs to be done. I see the dishes. I need to see the lawn. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? In the dark, and of course, this, is, this goes back to college days, I guess. But that's probably, too, why a lot of bars and nightclubs, they have dim lights, right? Everybody looks better in the dark, right? <laughs> But when the lights go on, all of a sudden you go, ooh, maybe not. This is how this is with us. In the dark, we look good, but the light comes on, and the light being Jesus, and all of a sudden we go, ooh, maybe not so much, right? And so what we need to see is that Jesus coming in the light that, that he came to reveal these things, and it's okay. In 1 Peter 1.18, it says, You know that in the past you were living in a worthless way. One of the things, could you imagine at some point going, your whole life, it's, you're living in a worthless way. And the, the Bible defines worthless as useless, futile, empty, aimless. And then the reality is, this is the life of everyone who's living without Christ. So a few, um, I guess, uh, last time we, uh, the youth and I, we went to a bowling, we went bowling in San Antonio one time. And I'm, I stopped to pull to the side of the road because I wanted to take this picture. Do y'all remember me taking this picture on some of them? And I kept on thinking there's a message there somewhere. But this is what struck me about this. Y'all know what this is, right? A porta potty? It's tagged. Somebody put their name on a porta potty. And I'm thinking, this is where you're staking your claim? I mean, right? You think about it. This is where you're saying, this is my territory. A porta potty? So here's what I'm going to ask you, y'all. Where are we finding our significance? 
right? I mean, honestly, what is it that bolsters yours and mine, our sense of worth? Is it your job, your kids, your grandkids? Tech going to the finals? I'll say that. You see the red and black. Where is it that you're finding your worth? It's easy to let other things and other people affect our perception of our own worth and our own value. Patrick Henry, who famously declared, give me liberty or give me death, wrote this in his last will and testament. He says, I now have given everything I own to my children. There is one more thing that I wish I could give them, and that is Christ. Because if they have everything I gave them and don't have Christ, they have nothing. Everything is nothing without Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one that saves us from that useless life. He says, you're bought not with something that ruins like gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. And it's interesting that Peter calls this gold and silver something that ruins. Because what we think, we think of gold and silver as something precious. And we think of it as something of value. Yet Peter says they're not. And why is this? It's because this gold and silver, it fails when it comes to meeting our real needs. Money can buy lots of things, but it cannot buy your salvation. It's only Jesus' blood that redeems us from an aimless and empty way of life to a life of great worth and purpose. Jesus was born for this. He was born to be the Savior of the world, but he can only be your Savior and mine, when we realize that we are born sinners and can't save ourselves. Jesus was born so we could see and know the heart of God. He was born so that we could be born again and have a life here of meaning and purpose and value as we look forward to a life everlasting. Now, I'm going to end by asking the same question that we did at the beginning. So what's your answer to the solution? And is your solution, is your answer the same as God's?